Chapter 38. Ice and Fire. Three days. That was how long it took to get to the Gerudo Fortress. It was a miserable three days, spent traversing the pass through the Gerudo Mountains. Link trudged amidst a crush of horses, cats, and veiled Gerudo. During the long march, flies seemed to emerge from nowhere, and the hideous, unwashed smell of the blinds permeated the air. Neither the Bulbins or Moblins seemed to care much for bathing or personal hygiene. As it wove through the rugged mountains and their roughied snow-capped peaks, the winds brought a slight relief from the day's oppressive heat, chilling Link's skin as he tried to keep up with the column of Gerudo. His guards nudged him periodically when they felt he was too slow. At least the night brought a welcome reprieve from the stiffingly hot days, but even then, it was a cold comfort. The days became a blur as they marched until nightfall and broke camp before dawn. Link ate little, nor did he have much water. By the third day of marching, he was sluggish, dizzy, and weak from thirst. Only the thought of rescue and his sense of duty stopped him from merely collapsing in the dirt. There was little chance of escape. For one thing, he feared that his ailing strength would betray him. Then there was the fact that there was nowhere to go. The path through the mountains was precarious, and the only means of escape would be to clamber down the steep slopes of jagged boulders. Even if he did try that, it wouldn't work. He'd be picked off by archers the moment the alarm was raised. Then again, they might just assume he would get himself killed and not bother going after him. But that was not likely. He was valuable, despite what the witches thought. The Gerudo knew this, and kept him under tight guard. Sheik would not have much opportunity to escape either. She had at least six Gerudo assigned to watch her. They seemed to think she might fight her way to freedom, regardless of how difficult that might be. Despite this, Sheik seemed to fare much better than he did, and spent most of her time meditating. The heat did not appear to bother her, despite her garments making Link quite convinced that the Sheikah really did have ice in their veins. The final stretch into Gerudo Valley was across a canyon, seemingly chiseled into the rugged ridges that marked the border of the Gerudo Kingdom. A single stone bridge spanned the length of the chasm, flanked by steep cliffs that plunged into the river below. Two enormous gatehouses stood on either side of the bridge, and a pair of watchtowers rose high into the sky on either side of the two sentinels. By the afternoon of the third day, they arrived at the Gerudo Fortress. It was a small city perched on a bluff, overlooking a wide river that threaded its way through the desert and into the plains beyond. Groves of palm and olive clung in loose clumps along the banks, and farmers worked the narrow expanse of fields growing along the river's shore. Link could see the canals that fed the sparse scattering of arable lands. And at another time, he might have marveled at the fact that anything could grow in this harsh land. What he did note, however, was that many of the fields appeared abandoned, and the small smattering of trees along the river shore were a sickly colour. Left to ponder, he might have concluded that the Gerudo's water supply was cursed or poisoned, but it was Sheik who guessed this first. There was no time for Link to consider the significance of the river being cursed, for the city loomed large on the opposite shore. Buildings with broad blue and white domes peeked over the battlements, and similarly styled towers watched over the surrounding countryside. The light of the setting sun brushed against the walls of the fortress, turning them a brilliant hue of gold and red. At another time, Link would have been awed at the sight of the grand facades and the tall towers standing above the walls. The city's wide gates provided an entryway into a maze of courtyards, where the walls and pillars were all stenciled with a mesmerizing display of flowers and plants, from blue tulips to cypress trees. Link was not given time to admire the city, nor was he able to get more than a glimpse of the people. Both he and Sheik were marched toward a building near the center of the fortress, drawing a crowd the further along the streets as they went. Many of the people were wearing kalats, loose, long-sleeved robes, mostly blue or purple. Only the Gerudo guards wore veils, gripping their trademark halberds tightly as they surveyed the restless throng. Link's guess was that not all the city's populace were Gerudo, for he spotted both men and children in the crowded streets. Their skin was darker than the Gerudo, and their accents were thicker. One thing they did have in common was that they all stared at Sheik, their looks ranging from curious to hostile. Several members of the crowd even went wild, cursing and yelling insults. Avail reacted quickly, ordering her guard to keep the onlookers back. Damn it! Avail cursed. Jamila was supposed to keep these people back! All of you, move! The guard formed a tight circle around their prisoners, doubling their pace. Several loud arguments had broken out in Gerudic between the guards and onlookers. 
Sheik appeared oblivious to the disturbance she was causing, even as they were marched through a set of doors on one side of yet another courtyard. Either that, or she was trying very hard to maintain a stoic composure. A Vale's party retreated from the square, swept quickly through a gate by their entourage. The gate permitted entrance into the fortress proper. A Vale led the way from the gatehouse and into a courtyard adorned with a white pavilion at one end. Within the shade, atop a platform, stood an empty throne. Link didn't get time to look closely at it, as he was ushered through a blur of corridors and rooms. Though he tried to make a mental note, he soon lost track of where they were going. Dizzy and light-headed, Link kept stumbling, only to be pushed onwards by his guards. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, they reached the cells. Unlike the stifling hot air above, the dungeons were cold. The repugnant smell of excrement permeated the stale air. When the cell door creaked open, and he was thrust into a cell, the door clanging loudly into place behind him, Link felt strangely relieved. Now that he was here, he wouldn't be forced to march any more. For a brief instant, old instincts stirred, and he scanned his surroundings with a critical eye. The cell was almost empty, the amenities sparse. A pallet of straw had been arranged against one wall with a blanket on top of it. A bucket stood nearby, and it reeked from being poorly cleaned. Ignoring the smell as best he could, and weary to the bone, Link sank down onto the straw, draping the blanket over himself. It wasn't comfortable, even for someone who was more than happy to sleep in a stable. Only a single torch at his gloomy cell hung in a sconce just beyond the door. As he lay there, trying to sink into sleep, Link thought he felt Sheik's gaze on him, but felt too tired for conversation. Despite his fatigue, sleep eluded Link. He was far too worried about his present circumstances to sleep well. What had become of Halvard? What about Navi? The masked man hadn't appeared since their conversation three days ago. Given how creepy he was, Link was surprised to find himself longing for him to return. Navi, on the other hand, had been taken to where the rest of the Kokiri's fairies were being kept. A veil assured him she was safe. But Link wasn't sure that he trusted her. At least he's with her own kind, Link thought vaguely. That thought didn't comfort him especially when he realized why he and Navi had been separated. If he tried to resist, the Gerudo or the witches could harm her, and they knew he wouldn't allow that to happen. As his thoughts became increasingly disjointed and confused from hunger, thirst, and lack of sleep, Link fell into an uneasy and uncomfortable slumber. Hours later, the guards changed. Link was roused from his sleep as the new guards changed the torch, then brought him some food and water. The food consisted of some bread and broth, the broth was unappetizing, but at least it was hot. The guards didn't offer him a word, nor did he think it was wise to ask for a veil. If they formed a connection between him and any kind of plot, he would undoubtedly find himself in more trouble than he was in already. Sheik, for her part, never uttered a word, save for when the guards brought her water and food. She spent the rest of the time sitting in a meditative pose, and could have been sleeping for all Link knew. He lay back in his pallet again wishing he could distract himself from his thoughts. The silence made it impossible. Were the sages and Impa trying to rescue him? Would Halvard keep his word and come to his aid? That was if he wasn't totally mad, as Navi suspected, or in league with Ganondorf. Link did not remember falling back to sleep. It wasn't restful. He could hear footsteps drumming against the stone, and then a creak of a door on old hinges. Link! A voice whispered nearby. He merely grunted, just wanting to go back to sleep. Link! Link jerked upright with a start just as his cell door opened. A figure stood in the doorway, looking down at him with her arms folded. Disapproval was written across her face as she appraised him and then turned to the guards. Well, so much for our legendary hospitality. I do love what our dear king has done with the place. The woman's voice was rich with sarcasm, and the two of the guards glanced at her warily. Don't look at me like that, she rebuked them. Link blinked a few times, shaking out of his stupor. And then he realized the woman was a veil. Sleep well? She asked casually. Well enough, Sheik replied flatly. Before Link or Sheik could say anything more, an annoying and familiar chuckle caught their attention. A veil scowled, gritting her teeth, and then spun around to face the newcomer. It's about time you showed up. What took you so long? Ugh, what is going on? Link wondered, still dazed. I had to make sure I wasn't seen. Halvard replied calmly. He looked to her two guards, and then back to her, his sinister smile gone as he gave her a questioning look. They're fine, Avail said. I made sure the guards on duty were loyal to me. Link pulled himself to his feet. 
He had to use the cell's bars for support, his legs wobbling in a moment of dizziness. What? What's going on? He rubbed his head. It still hurt something fierce. That was when he noticed that Navi wasn't with Avail or Halvard. His mind was so sluggish, he hadn't realized she was missing. Where's Navi? Are you always so full of questions, boy? Halvard asked pleasantly. Just tell me where she is, Link demanded, wanting nothing to do with the man's eccentricities. Avail said something to one of her guards, who came forward with a small goblet, which she pushed into Link's hands. From the next cell, the other guard gave Sheik a goblet of her own. It's a potion, Avail explained. It will help clear your head. Link stared at the goblet, grimacing as he recognized the smell of healing potion. Staring at it won't make it taste nicer, Avail told him, almost sounding sympathetic. It's quite safe. Link nodded and downed the potion, nearly retching as he did so. He wondered vaguely how Ingo had ever managed to convince a horse to eat feed contaminated with the stuff. As his head began to feel less like it had been filled with a horde of angrily buzzing hornets, he passed the goblet back to the guard with a murmured thanks. Where is Navi? he asked again. Halvard pulled a pouch from his robes. The small bag bulged as something inside of it moved. Navi! It seemed cruel and undignifying for her to be in there, even if it was necessary. What if to put her in there? he asked angrily, wanting nothing more than for Halvard to release her. You do realize a fairy flying around will attract far too much attention, he asked mildly. Don't worry, she's perfectly safe. As it were, I suggested a bottle might be more comfortable, but she insisted on this pouch. An odd choice, to be sure, but she did threaten me with certain death if I bottled her. Though I am puzzled as to how she intended to carry that out. Hurry up, we need to get him out of here quickly, Avail said, cutting short any further conversation. A moment, Avail, Halvard said warily, as though the Gerudo's impatience was really annoying him. He reached into another pocket of his robe, pulling two objects out and displaying them in his hand. <clears throat> The first was a violet medallion, which Link recognized instantly, Impa's amulet. The second was a white stone engraved with a weeping eye. Sheik's eyes went wide when she saw the medallion. Where did you get that? She demanded. Who gave it to you? Impa was kind enough to lend it to me, Harvard said calmly. She is alive and still disguised as Rin. She said you would know how to use this. I trust you do, don't you? She nodded, almost snatching the medallion out of Halvard's hands as he passed it to her. Then he pre-offered the white stone, and Link stared at it blankly. What is that? This is a portal stone, said Halvard, holding it out for Link to see more closely. I had to make sure I cast the spell on the other side of the river, away from the Gerudo. There are those who are still not loyal to Avail, and they would no doubt come after us. The spell will not work from here, or anywhere close to the middle of the fortress, if that's the case, Sheik pointed out. The range is limited, and the further away it is, the harder it becomes to trigger the spell that will send us to where we need to go. I know. We will have to get to the wall closest to the river. Link couldn't help but spot a glaring problem with that idea. Even if Sheik could use the medallion to turn invisible, he still stood out like a lone Goron in a market square. Well, maybe not quite as badly as a Goron, but it was enough to get a Gerudo's attention. How am I going to get out of here? He asked. The Gerudo aren't just going to stand around while I try to escape or retrieve my equipment. I don't see many Gerudo dressed in green garbs. With a sock for a hat, Avail added, a tiny smile curving on the edges of her mouth. Have a little faith, boy, Halvard said. I've already thought of that. Avail's smile broadened. Link stared at her. He didn't have a clue what was so funny. Halvard, who seemed to have a talent for stuffing all sorts of things in his robe, was now holding another mask in his other hand. Link hadn't noticed it before, but Halvard held it up so that it caught the torchlight. Link saw that it was fashioned in the exact likeness of a Gerudo's face, complete with the gem on the forehead. How is that supposed to help? Link asked, feeling more than a little perplexed. It is a mask of illusion. Those who see you, except for a Sheikah, will see you as a Gerudo woman, Halvard replied. You mean it will turn me into a... Link began, his face going pale with horror. Wait, n no, no, we're not doing that. There was just something really wrong with the idea. Link didn't like it at all. Avail just snorted, rolling her eyes. Ah, she said in an undertone, the joys of arguing with a youth. It doesn't quite work like that, Harvard said slowly, ignoring Avail. True, some masks can turn you into something else entirely, but they usually require dark magic to make. Exceptionally dark magic. 
Perhaps you can explain that at another time? Sheik suggested quickly, before turning to Link. If you're concerned about embarrassing yourself, I won't notice any difference. Well, I guess that counts for something, Link thought. We need to hurry, Avail interrupted his thoughts. Of course, Harvard replied with a small bow. Well, first we'll need to retrieve Link's equipment. Avail and I took the liberty of hiding it in the stables. With some help, of course. We should head there first. You realize the witches will see right through this mask, Link said as he took it in his hands. Koyume and Kotake believe they were summoned to Ganondorf's tower. When they arrive, they shall discover that they were never summoned at all, Avail said, sounding unconcerned, and we will be long gone before they get back. There is one thing, however. The Mithirans are heading towards the fortress. They plan to attack tonight. Are the other Gerudo aware of this? She gasped. Of course, said Avail. Ganondorf's eyes and ears are everywhere. We must hurry. Mariko wasn't able to cure all of my lieutenants from this curse. If they catch us, she glared at Link upon realizing he hadn't put the mask on. Resigning himself to their plan, he allowed Avail to steer him towards the door. Sheik gripped the shadow medallion, and the air around her shimmered. She vanished. Why can't I do that? He asked. Becoming invisible would have made things a lot easier. Because you are not a Sheikah, Sheik replied. Besides, I can't make more than one person invisible. The magic infused in the medallion would drain too quickly. Hurry up and put the mask on, Avail said impatiently. Link stared at the mask with growing fear. He didn't like this plan at all, but it was the only chance they had. What about the other Kukiri? Aren't we going to rescue them? And just how do you intend to do that? Getting three people out is going to be difficult enough. Avail looked at him as though she thought he was slightly thick-headed. Until you break the curse of my people, letting them go would be difficult, and either the Twin Rover Sisters or Ganondorf would interfere. Who were the Twin Rover Sisters? Link asked. Koyume and Kotake, the two witches, Avail explained. She sighed, exasperation clear on her face. Look, wait until we're out of here, okay? Once we are, we can play 20 questions to your heart's content. Taking a deep breath, and ignoring the fact that Avail now seemed quite convinced he was a semi-witless child, Link placed the mask on, shuddering as a chill ripped through his body. It was not as unpleasant as putting on the mask he'd used to dive to the depths of Lake Hylia, but it was still unsettling. Well, don't you look nice? Avail sounded deeply amused as she stared him up and down. I'm glad you went for a more tasteful attire than a sparring uniform. Most Hylians think we have no sense of dignity whatsoever. It's a shame we don't have a mirror. You do look quite catching. Blushing furiously, Link looked down, but saw no difference in his appearance. That was confusing. Maybe he'd notice if he took a veil suggestion and looked in a mirror, but part of him really didn't want to do that. Sheik, can you go ahead and ready the horses? Harvard said. They didn't hear her go, and Link waved his hand through the air where she'd been standing. She's gone, said Harvard. Let's hurry. Walking through the labyrinth of corridors, Link was glad he wasn't expected to find the way out on his own. He would never have made it. Anyone attempting to escape the dungeons would have been likely to die from thirst and hunger before they got out. Finally, they stepped onto a corridor, moonlight splashing through windows and bathing the empty corridor. The two guards that had been assigned to his and Sheik's cell went towards one end of the corridor, while a veil took the other direction. Link and Halvard followed closely on her heels. A strange feeling twisted Link's gut into knots as he walked past guards, all of whom greeted him with a nod. None of them actually spoke to him, for which Link was glad, as he couldn't speak Gerudic. That small dilemma, which Halvard had neglected to mention, was sure to be a dead giveaway if anyone spoke to him. Was that why Avail was doing her best to look like she was in a very foul mood? Almost everyone darted out of the group's way. Even the several servants who came out of side passages into their corridor gave a squeak and scurried off in the opposite direction. One dropped a vase, fumbling, then catching it before it could shatter on the floor. With one frightened glance at Avail, the young girl disappeared down the passage. You know, it's only a matter of time before somebody wonders why you're doing that, Halvard whispered. Be quiet, Avail hissed. She's enjoying this too much. They passed an armory, and Link caught a glimpse of pole arms hanging on racks. Mounted on the walls were shields of luminous silver, a band of red around its edge gleamed like a ruby, and there was a sunburst engraved into the center. Link could see his reflection in the shield, or rather, the reflection of a Gerudo in a simple blue and white dress, a grey cowl drawn back and resting against his shoulders. Mirror shields, Harvard whispered when he saw what Link was looking at. They can reflect magic from their surface. You can imagine what a start that gave the poor, unfortunate mages who first came across them. 
Link was busy pondering, worrying about how they would escape, when he tripped on a loose stone and nearly fell. A veil quickly caught him under the arm, and he whispered his thanks. She said nothing, and quickly gestured Link forward. He'd barely made it a few more steps when a cackle from behind made him turn. Link's breath caught in his throat at the sight of an old witch, a red ruby encrusted on her forehead. Koyume. Her long, crooked nose seemed to add to the look of wild delight in her large, bulbous eyes. She was standing a few feet away, leaning on her broom as if it were a staff. Oh, goddesses. They had been so close to escaping. Koyume was eyeing him with a predatory grin, the same expression she gave him right before torturing him. Link's heart sank into his stomach as an icy wave of horror flooded into him. Ho! Oh, what do we have here? Kiyomi cackled, waving a sleeve of her fine blue and grey robes towards Link. Koyume wasn't supposed to be here, he thought. She was supposed to be at Ganondorf's tower. There was another cackle as Koyume's sister materialized out of thin air, holding her broom like a staff. They turned to Halvard, who was oddly still smiling. Is he mad? Link thought. Ah, hello. I don't suppose you fine mistresses care to tell us the way out? Harvard asked pleasantly. You see, we seem to have taken a wrong turn. Avail looked like she wanted nothing more than to smack him over the head. Ha! <laughs> nice try! Koyume snickered at him. Traitor! I'll burn you! Kotake screeched, earning a mocking smile from Koyume. I was never on your side to begin with, Harvard said, while Link and Avail backed away. Oh, you are an insolent one, aren't you? Koyume said. The two Gerudo rounded the corridor and froze at the spectacle, their eyes darting from the witches to Link and his companions. Avail didn't even bother pulling her veil up. She spun around, unsheathing a knife, and sent it flying towards Koyume. Run! She said. All of you! Link obeyed, running towards the wall as fire blossomed from Koyume's outstretched hand. The flames danced and twisted through the corridor and struck the two Gerudo. Their ear-splitting screams seemed all too familiar. When Link chanced to look back, he saw nothing but a pile of charred and smoldering bones. Shock turned to outrage as he realized Koyume had just killed two of her own without any remorse. A veil swore loudly. Run! Harvard yelled as a veil sent her second knife flying towards Kotake. Link dashed forward, dodging another stream of fire that gushed past him. He did not have Impa's ring, and he knew that being hit by fire now could well be fatal. What do we do? He asked. Head to the armory! A veil ordered. Both of you! I shouldn't need to tell you that fighting in a room full of magic-repelling mirrors is a bad idea. Halvard deadpanned. They can't fight either, a veil told him. Quick, inside! Link darted for the doorway to his left, dodging a frigid blast that struck the wall, leaving a sheet of ice along the stone. Use your eyes, Kotake! Koyume screeched. Can't you see properly, sis? Your aim is not much better, Kotake retorted. Both witches gripped their brooms and flew towards the fleeing trio, but by then, Halvard, Link, and Avail were almost in the armory, leaping to avoid the flames that washed through the corridor. Link crashed into a suit of armor, Pain blossomed across his side as the suit of armor hit the ground, clanging and crashing with enough noise to wake the dead. He fell amongst the suit, cursing as the blow knocked the mask clean from his face. Grunting with pain, he got up and fled as Koyomi sent another wash of flames through the doorway. As she did so, she failed to check what was behind her target as Kotake flew in to get better aim at Link. Watch out! Koyomi shrieked. And Kotake looked just in time to see Koyume's spell slam straight into one of the silver shields adorning the far wall. The torrent of flames rebounded off the silver shield and headed straight towards the witches. Eesh! Kotake screamed, steering her broom out of the way. You try to kill me, sis! Don't get in my way next time! Koyume shouted back. The, w the flames washed harmlessly over her, only to hit an unfortunate Gerudo outside. One glance at the Gerudo writhing on the ground, and the pungent smell of burning flesh. Link knew that the woman was well beyond any help. You'll pay for that! A veil snarled, trying to reach her fallen comrade. A continual bombardment of ice and fire barred her way, and she cursed. Link could hear Navi's indignant squeaks emitting from Halvard's pocket. The man took cover and quickly released the sprite. She shrieked with alarm as Kotake zipped around the rack that was sheltering herself and Halvard. The masked man darted out of the way, while Navi ducked to avoid a spray of sharp icicles. 
Koyume, meanwhile, aimed a spell at a nearby stone statue that resembled a hideous fusion of a lion and man. The armored giant trembled, coming to life with a roar. It lumbered towards Link, brandishing its giant war axe. Link jumped away just as the weapon came crashing down. He rolled, pushing himself up just in time to get out of the way, as another blow came within inches of beheading him. Navi! He yelled. A little help here? He grabbed a pole arm and threw it clumsily at the creature, the stone beast's axe cut Link's weapon through its shaft, splitting it in half. You've got to be kidding me, he thought, looking at the broken weapon and casting it aside. He then saw the monster coming towards him, its axe whistling through the air again. He dodged. Barely. I could really do with a Goron bomb or two about now. A veil threw him one of the silver mirror shields, and it landed beside him. Snatching it up, Link deftly sidestepped a frigid blast of ice that bounced off the mirror shield and into the wall. Navi was looking panic-stricken as she surveyed the scene, a sure sign they were in deep trouble. The stone statue's axe came down again. Navi! Link called, trying to break her trance. Help me! Uh, don't panic? She stammered, looking around the room, no doubt searching for something that might be useful. I was hoping for something a little more helpful, Link growled. He was growing more desperate and irate by the second. Just in its weak spot. It's a rock, Navi. It doesn't have a weak spot, Link bellowed. Well, I don't know, she screamed back. Try deflecting the witch's spell into it with one of the mirror shields. Stop helping him, you stupid insect, Kotake screamed as she flew towards Navi. The fairy cried out and flew behind Link's shield. Another fireball sent a suit of armor crashing to the ground, marking enough noise to alert the entire fortress to the commotion. Link knew that not all within the walls would be loyal to a veil. He ducked beneath another rush of fire that sent a veil onto the floor, shrieking and cursing as the side of her clothing caught fire. She rolled on the ground, trying to smother the flames while grabbing a mirror shield of her own. Link jumped in front of a veil, just as Halva did as well, both raising their shields to deflect the twin rover sisters' attack. Kotake flew into the corridor, while Koyume cackled and sent a stream of fire towards Link, as he was busily sidestepping another blow from the statue. Link raised the mirror shield to intercept the fiery blast, and the flames bounced off the surface of the shield and into the night. The stone exploded, bits of it slamming into Link and knocking him over. His head swam, his eyes stinging from the smoke caused by the numerous small fires around the room. Link struggled to his feet. There came a laugh from behind him, and he realized Kotake was there. Not wasting a moment, Halvas jumped between them with his shield raised. From somewhere beyond the armory, a horn blew. Its cry was quickly followed by a crash of gongs that reverberated through the fortress, trembling into the stone foundations. Beside him, Halvard whispered urgently, The witches are vulnerable to each other's attacks. We need to make them hit each other. How? Link asked. Just do exactly as I say, Halvard replied, a blast of ice bouncing off his shield. This has been an entertaining display, Kotake chortled, but it ends here. With my flame, I'll burn you to the bone, Koyume declared. With my frost, I will freeze you to your soul, cried Kotake. Really, this that's getting old, Koyume complained. What? Yeah, well, it's better than yours, Kotake snapped back. Now shut up while I kill these outrageous... Wait, I want to finish what I started. Koyume cut her sister off, smiling cruelly at Link. He gulped, knowing what was coming. That was when Navi flew straight in front of him. No, I won't let you hurt him. Navi! Link hissed, stepping forward. No, I won't let you hurt him. Koyume laughed, looking thoroughly excited. It looks like I have a volunteer, sis. Very well, I've done this to a fairy before. He screamed and squealed for ages while I set his blood on fire. Wasn't a very pretty sight afterwards. Shame the little rant of a boy got away, or he would have been next. Navi went rigid with shock, a faint and feeble whisper escaping her throat. Arden. Link seethed at the mention of Ferenz. He couldn't believe the witch actually sounded disappointed. Something inside of him cried out, urging him to rush forward and attack the witch, hitting her with everything he had. They'll regret that, he thought savagely. It took all of his will not to rush at them and attack, knowing that was probably what they wanted him to do. He scanned his surroundings for a bow. Even a hook shot might come in handy. But he found nothing. Koyume shot forward, hands raised towards Navi. No! Link bellowed, snatching Navi from the air as a hot, prickling pain began spreading through him. Goddesses! It was happening again. Link, get down! 
Halvard yelled, turning the attention of both witches on him. Link dropped to the ground just as Kotake let loose a stream of white light. Koyume unleashed her own attack. The two streams of magic shot through the air in a mesmerizing dance of ice and fire. The energy from the attacks rippled through the air, singeing his fringe. Link flattened himself lower to the ground. The witches shrieked, almost in unison, both trying to throw up some form of magical shield to block the other's spell. Kotake formed a rippling shield in the air in front of her. It withstood the brunt of the attack. Koyume, however, was not fast enough. A loud crack reverberated through the air as the witch was turned into a hideous-looking ice sculpture. Then, the ice shattered, leaving nothing left of Koyume except small puddles of cold water. Kotake gave a horrible scream of anguish, her eyes nearly bulging out of their sockets. Halvard helped her veil up and started sprinting out of the armory. All the while, Link kept his mirror shield aloft and snatched up the Gerudo mask. Seeing that it was still intact, he donned the mask. You! You killed my sister! You killed her! I'll kill you! Kotake's scream chased Link into the corridor as he bolted after Avail and Harvard. I'll get you! I'll get you and your little fairy too! Link scraped a scimitar off the floor as a stream of ice cut its way across the floor towards him. It missed, the ice melting as it came close to a weapons rack, still alight from Koyume's attack. Navi hid in Link's pocket, and he ran. He met the others outside the doorway, just as Gerudo after Gerudo poured into the corridor, weapons barred and veils raised. Most of them relaxed at the sight of the veil, if only a little. She shouted an order. Whatever that was said, they obeyed, most of them running back to where they came, while the rest went to investigate the armory. As he moved towards a flight of stairs, Link dared a look back to see Kotake being chased off by a dozen Gerudo, their spears level with the ground. She fled and Link continued running. He darted up the stairs and down the corridor, until he reached a door into one of the many courtyards. It opened onto a scene of madness.